Welcome back everyone. In this video, I want to show you that not all differentiable functions are equal to their Maclaurin series. In previous videos, I put a lot of emphasis on if a function is equal to its power series, if a function is equal to its Maclaurin series, if it's equal to its Taylor series. And then in the last previous videos, we the last few previous videos, we actually showed specifically how can you show uh, whether a function is equal to its Maclaurin series or not using Taylor's inequality. Why is this such a big deal? Well, because sometimes there are functions are, which are not equal to their Maclaurin series. So case in point, consider the function f of x, which is given by the following, the following rule, e to the negative one over x squared when x is not zero, and it's equal to zero when x equals zero. So let's explore this function for a moment. Since we define f of x to equal e to the negative one over x squared for every number except for x equals zero, um, it's gonna be continuous everywhere except potentially at zero, right? This is a piecewise function. Is there a discontinuity at zero? Hmm. Let's, let's investigate this and we'll actually see that this function is continuous. So what we wanna do is we wanna take the limit. We wanna take the limit as x approaches zero Consider this function e to the negative one over x squared. Now notice that if you take, if you just plug in x equals zero right there, e to the negative one over zero squared, clearly that thing is undefined, right? That thing doesn't, is undefined. So although the function can't be evaluated at zero, that e to the negative one over x squared, what we do get is that we can take the limit as x goes to zero in that situation. Now in that situation, because the exponential is a continuous function, we can actually take it out of this limit process, the, e, the, the base e right there. And so we end up with something like e raised to the limit as x approaches zero of negative one over x squared. So what is happening in this situation? So in this situation, as x approaches zero, we're gonna have x, we're gonna get one over zero basically, right? Which one over zero is gonna be something infinite. It's gonna be positive or negative infinity, but it turns out it doesn't matter which approach you take because you're squaring things, you're gonna end up with a positive infinity. And so what we see here is that this thing is gonna, so as x approaches infinity, one over x squared is going to be, so as x approaches infinity, I'll be explicit here, we see that one over x squared is gonna approach, oh, I said it wrong, I'm sorry as x approaches zero, one over x squared will approach infinity. That's what I was trying to say. And therefore this limit is the same thing as the limit as t approaches infinity of e to the negative t, something like that. And so we know what happens to the exponential as you get closer and closer to infinity, e to the negative infinity will get closer and closer to zero, the horizontal asymptote of e to the x. So in fact, this tells us that e to the negative one over x squared, it approaches zero as x gets closer to zero. And so basically what happened is this function has a removable discontinuity in it, and we're just adding back in that removable, that, that remove point. And therefore this function is continuous at all values over its entire domain, negative infinity to infinity. That's the first, first thing to mention. So we, we wanna show that this function is differentiable, but we start off with showing that it is continuous, okay? So now let's consider the derivative, right? We're going to show, so if we look at the limit, so take the limit as x approaches infinity, sorry, as x approaches zero of the expression f of x minus f of zero over x minus zero. Notice we're taking the limit of a difference quotient, and so we're going to show that this function is differentiable. Well, clearly we can take the derivative of e to the negative one over x squared, but the problem is since x equals zero is defined differently, we have to compute the derivative a little bit differently in this situation. So let's compute the derivative of the function at zero. So if we take a look at this limit, the limit as x approaches zero of f of x, which, which just make a sort of an aside here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to compute f prime of zero. What is the derivative at zero? We can do the derivative anywhere else. What happens at zero? We get f of x minus f of zero over x minus zero. So some things to note here, is that f of zero is itself zero, right? Um, and f of x will look like e to negative one over x squared for any number that's close to zero. So when you take the limit, remember this is calculus one stuff right here. When you take the limit, we don't actually plug in x equals zero. Continuity allows us to do that, but we have to investigate what happens to the function as we get close and close and close to zero, closer to zero. Now the function, if you're not equal to zero, will look like e to the negative one over x squared. 
Uh, so that's what f of x we can plug in for. Now f of zero itself is zero. And on the bottom we get x minus zero. So this would simplify to be the form, again x is approaching zero here, we get the limit as e uh, of e to the negative one over x squared over x as x approaches zero right here. And so we wanna compute this thing right here. We wanna compute this. Well, notice you have a negative exponent on top, uh, this negative one to the negative one over x squared. You can bring e to the bottom and well, we also, just to make to make life a little bit easier to us, I'm also gonna bring the x to the top, right? This will make much more sense in just a second, but if we move things around, you're gonna get the limit as x approaches zero of one over x divided by e to the positive one over x squared, like so. Now notice what happens as x goes to zero in that situation. On the top, as x goes to zero, one over x, you know, if you're approaching from the right, as x approaches zero from the right, one over x will get closer and closer to infinity. Uh, in the denominator, as x approaches zero, one over x squared will get closer and closer and closer to infinity as well. We get zero or e to the infinity. This thing will look like infinity over infinity. This is an indeterminate form. And therefore, we're gonna use L'Hopital's rule next. L'Hopital's rule, take the limit of top and bottom. The top isn't so bad, uh, just one over x. You're gonna end up with negative one over x squared. Now, if you take the derivative of e to the one over x squared, there's no problem with the derivative of that function, just the issue at zero is what's going on here. So if you take the derivative by the chain rule, you're gonna get back the exponential one over x squared. You're gonna then times that by the inner derivative, which is gonna be negative two over x cubed. Now there's some simplification that's gonna happen between this negative one over x squared and this friend right here. Uh, basically, I want to times the whole fraction by x cubed over x cubed because I know these negatives will cancel out. It's a double negative. So if I times top and bottom by x cubed, you end up with the limit as x approaches zero. On the top, you will end up with just an x. In the denominator, you're going to get two times e to the one over x squared, like so. All right. And so in this situation, what then is happening, as x approaches zero, the top is gonna to look like zero. The bottom is gonna look like infinity, like it did before. Now dividing by zero, or dividing by infinity is actually the same thing as times by zero. These two are actually congruent with each other. This limit is equal to zero. And so this actually tells us that the first derivative of this function evaluated zero is gonna equal zero. So what we've now shown is we now have a function which is differentiable. It's differentiable everywhere. The only concern was at zero, of course, but we've now shown that the function's continuous at zero and it's differentiable at zero. Let's actually take a look at what this function looks like. What does y equals f of x look like if we take a graph here? Uh, so I took the liberty of graphing this prior to the start. This is with the computer. Uh, so this is our function. This is e to the negative one over x squared, uh, which again, that function typically has a removable discontinuity at the origin, we filled it back in by defining it to be zero right there. And so when you look at this function, you look at the origin, it looks really, really, really flat at the origin. That's somewhat of an optical illusion because um, if we were to zoom in, we would see that never, ever, ever is it horizontal. Uh, but to the naked eye, it looks like it's flat. It looks like it's a constant function near the origin. Again, that's, that's, that's not true, but that's actually one of the reasons why we're looking at this function. Because if you were to look at the tangent line of this function at the origin, the tangent line is gonna give you a horizontal, a horizontal line. Um, there's a horizontal tangent there. And so when you get far away from the origin, this is grossly inaccurate, right? This thing will asymptotically converge towards one as X goes to positive or negative infinity. But if you start involving other Taylor polynomials, like if you look at the, uh, if you look at a Taylor uh, parabola, right, you're still gonna get a flat line. If you look at a Taylor cubic polynomial, you're also gonna get a flat line. The thing is, we're gonna see in just a second that the flatness near the origin is actually saying that all of the higher derivatives are gonna be zero as well. And so let's take a look at that. So uh, the next bit, let me actually prove a very useful identity here. So if we take the derivative of e to the negative one over x squared divided by x, to the n, that gives us the following formula. We can see this very quickly just from our usual derivative rules, right? So if we apply the quotient rule in this situation, we get low x to the n, d high, the derivative of the top, 
which like we saw before, this is gonna look like e to the negative one over x squared times the inner derivative, which will be in this case, a positive two over x cubed. And then we subtract, so we did low d high minus high d low, take the derivative of the bottom, that's gonna be n times x to the n minus one. Square the bottom, here we go, and the bottom you're gonna get x to the two n, like so. Um, and so then try to simplify this thing if there's anything we can do. Uh, really, some things to note here is you have an x cubed right here. We have a uh, x to the n right here. Those will combine together. Uh, those combine together to give you x to the n minus 3. Uh, let, me, let me write that together here. If you factor out um, the, well, I guess I don't necessarily need to factor it out because they have these things right here, the e. Uh, we, we can factor that out, but we'll just leave it the way it is. So if you do the first part, you're going to have x to the n minus 3. Uh, there's also this factor of 2 that's right there, 2. This will sit above x to the 2n. And you times that by e to the negative 1 over x squared. And then you're subtracting from it, because we're subtracting right here. We're going to have minus n x to the n minus 1 over x to the 2n. And then that power of e shows up one more time. And then simplifying these powers of, of x right there, right? You have 2n on top, you have n minus 1 on the bottom. The n's cancels, then you get an n. Uh, you're going to get, when you put this together, right? A negative 3 goes actually to the bottom. So you're going to end up with an x to the n minus 3, or n plus 3 on the top, bottom, excuse me. So you get 2 over x plus 3, e to the negative 1 over x squared. And then for the other term, you get something similar, right? The n's, you're going to get an n that cancels here. So you, uh, so you just get an n on bottom, you have a negative 1 on top. The negative 1 comes down, so you get an n plus 1. And so then we end up with negative n over x to the n plus 1, e to the negative 1 over x squared. And so that verifies the identity we were trying to show. That when you start taking derivatives of this e to the negative 1 over x squared over x to the n, you get something that looks like this. Well, why is that relevant? Well, now I want you to take a look at the following, right? Uh, let's compute. We're now ready to compute the Maclaurin series for this function f, and we're going to consider its radius of convergence. Now, with the with the Maclaurin series, right? Taylor's inequality or Taylor's Taylor's equation, excuse me, tells us that c n is going to equal f, the nth derivative of f evaluated at at this case zero, since it's Maclaurin series divided by n factorial. So, in order to do Taylor's inequality, we're going to need to know um, the nth derivative of our function here, and one can show that the nth derivative of our function, it'll look something like the following. You're going to get, uh, you're going to get uh, e to the negative one over x squared times a sum, k equals zero to three to the n of some coefficient sequence, uh, we'll call it a sub k right here, divided by x to the k. Uh, so what basically what we get from what we get from what we saw before, right? Uh, so coming back to coming back to what we saw before, right? When you start taking the derivative of e to the negative one over x squared, uh, did we ever do that somewhere? We did. Remember, uh, we were doing it over here with L'Hopital's rule. We had to take the derivative. Well, we actually did negative one over x squared, uh, but we take the derivative of of this thing. So other than some signs, right, the derivative is going to look like the original exponential. You're going to get the original exponential, and then you're going to get a multiple with a power of x in the denominator. But what happens when you take the next derivative, right? Um, so like if you took if you took this thing, you take this e to the negative 1 over x squared. Now you have like this uh, positive 2 over x cubed. When you take the derivative again, you have to do the quotient rule. And by the quotient rule, you're going to get something that looks like this, right? We had this coefficient of three right there, and then there was this two in front, no big deal. That's gonna affect things, so you get like, a, you're gonna get like a four right here, you're gonna get a six right there, um, then you're gonna get a three right there and a four right there. The point is, you're gonna get something that looks like this, these things right here. You have an e to the negative x squared divided by some power of x, you're going to get e to the negative 1 over x squared divided by some power of x. That's what we have right here. And when you take the derivative, you're going to get two more things that look like this. There's this similarity between the function and its derivative. 
And so no matter which derivative you take, no matter which derivative you take, um, the, the higher derivatives of e to the negative 1 over x squared will look like e to the negative 1 over x squared times some linear combination of reciprocal powers of x. Like so, when you take derivatives, you're just going to get this form over and over and over and over again. And so mimicking the strategy we did before, because technically this guy is not defined at x equals 0, but if you take the limit as x approaches 0, you will see that this expression will go to 0 over and over and over again. So using this idea of limits and derivatives that we're introducing right here, we're going to see that f, the nth derivative of our function evaluated at 0, is equal to 0. That's the key observation right here. Therefore, when you look at cn, you're going to get 0 over n factorial. That's always equal to 0. And so then when you look at the Maclaurin series, t of x, this will look like the sum where n goes from 0 to infinity of... 0 over n factorial times x to the n. This will equal 0 plus 0x zero plus 0x zero squared plus 0x cubed, et cetera, et cetera. This is just the constant function 0, right? And as this function, this is this Maclaurin series is just 0. I don't even need to do the ratio test to find out the radius of convergence here. The radius of convergence here will be infinity because this is just a constant function 0. Now let's go back to our function graph, right? Does this function look like the zero function? Nah, there is curvature going on here. And so what we can see from this example, it took a bit to explain it, uh, but we see that this function is an example of a differentiable function that does not equal its Maclaurin series on the interval of convergence. The interval of convergence, remember, was negative infinity to infinity. But the only place where the function agrees with its center, or the only place where the function agrees with its Maclaurin series is at the center, right here. When x equals 0, y equals 0, and the two functions agree with each other. And when it comes to a, a power series, the power series must be convergent at its center. Ours, of course, is convergent for everywhere. But more importantly, a power series representation will always agree with the function at the center, but you have no guarantees that it'll be, they'll be equal anywhere else. So even on that interval of convergence, which is huge, this function is nowhere equal to its, its uh, power series representation. So do watch out about that, that this idea of if a function is equal to its Maclaurin series and proving that it is, is actually a very legitimate question. Now, we did that for some very basic functions like e to the x and sine of x, and you can mimic those strategies to show it for other important functions like cosine and sinh and cosh or something like that. So we're going to kind of take it for granted going forward that functions are equal to their Maclaurin series, but hopefully this example teaches you that that is an assumption we're making just to make life easier for right now. It is a question that someone would have to return and resolve eventually. It's like in a physics class, like saying, let's play with a model which is frictionless. Where are you going to find a frictionless environment? Never, never, never. But we, as an educational tool, often make these assumptions so that we can focus on other aspects without worrying about other things that complicate the process. A function equaling its Maclaurin series is such a problem, which although we are going to kind of ignore it going forward, this example teaches us that it's a big problem and one should actually care about it at some point or another.